What is auto framing do? Sorry, I'm just testing this camera. I don't think I want it on auto framing. What does speaker focus do? That's like the same thing. Oh no, I kind of yes. Hey, I'm over here. Can you see me over here, camera? No. I'm supposed to do. All right, well, welcome back to Sociology One. So the other day, I, my recording of the class didn't come out very well because I left the screen sharing on. So everything I was doing ended up just being in a little box up here. And all you see is this screen sharing that says something unintelligible on there, that whiteboard thing I was trying to do. So, uh, so what I want to do is just review real quickly some of the things we said the other day so that we can still use this video to make sure uh, we have a complete set of notes. So we're trying to understand the key terms, uh, and these are overall key terms. You know, every throughout the course we'll have key terms, but these are sort of overall ones to help us um, start the class because these are terms that we'll bring up again and again, and I just want to make sure we understand them. And the first one was sociological imagination, and uh, somebody asked the other day, um, you know, which is the key term here, and uh, this is the key term, but there are a few things I want to make sure you understand about this uh, concept. Um, one is, you know, it was C. Wright Mills, was the American sociologist who came up with this idea. I want to highlight that because we're going to learn more that sociology more came from Europe and it came from a long time ago. But thinking about Mills kind of connects sociology to us here in America and makes us feel like, okay, sociology isn't just some weird thing from a long time ago, but does connect to us today in a lot of ways. And he wanted to understand, you know, why are people seem like they're cheerful robots? That's another idea I'm holding you responsible for here. And that was this idea that uh, he thought a lot of Americans at that time in the 1950s were um, too engaged in mindless conformity or just kind of going along with what society said they should be doing. So that meant, for example, women just accepting being secondary to their husbands and not having power in the society, or non-white people accepting that they don't have power in society, or people of various alternative lifestyles, what we nowadays you know, call gay people and transgender people and things like that, how they should just stay in the closet and be quiet and not try to shake up anything. And Mills felt like, well, maybe it's a good idea for people to shake up things. He thinks a lot of people suffer from what he called private troubles, but if they were to make these into public issues, in other words, bring them into public awareness and get people talking about them and get politicians thinking about how to fix them, that that's how you can make society better. And that that's what we in sociology are trying to do. I mean, um, whether you're a small s sociologist is what I call all of us, be, meaning we're not professional sociologists, this is your first sociology class, but you already are a sociologist. You already are trying to live in society and navigate it. Capital S sociologists are professional sociologists like myself who've gone through training and you're gonna be getting some training this term, but whether you're a uh, capital S sociologist or a small s sociologist, the goal is to try and make social life work better. And so um, some people think you can't do that. I mean, some people believe that there's a human nature, that we are just humans and we're just bad people and we go around harming each other and that's just how it is. And sociology really starts from the perspective that no, humans can change our nature. Maybe for the last 100,000 years we've been killing each other and being selfish and depriving each other of things, but that doesn't mean we always have to be that way. And that if you shape your society in a better way, then the people living in it could act better and treat each other better. That's the main hope of sociology, I would say. And, and Mill says, if you have that hope for yourself, I can make things better for myself and people like me. If you don't have that hope, if you're just like, nah, things just are the way they are, Everything happens for a reason. I hate to hear people say that. It's a, it's a fatalistic attitude. It's just accepting things as they are. But Mills said, don't accept it. 
challenge it. Uh, you can change it. You can make it better. And so, uh, and so how do you do that? He says we have to think about how our biography intersects with history. How we are just an individual person growing up. I was talking, if I can mention you, Lindsay, can I talk about you a little bit? Uh, so uh, she was saying, you know, her grandma and grandpa were migrant farm workers here in California. She hasn't learned too much about what they experienced. And I would think like comparing her grandma and grandpa's experiences being market farm workers in California, compare that to her mom's experience, mom and dad, what has been their experience as Latino people in California. What's your experience as a Latino person in California? And thinking through those things, learning about them, I mean, we don't just know them. You have to go interview people, talk to people, study things, read books. But gaining this knowledge of who you are What's my biography? Who are the people that made me who I am? And how does it fit into history right now? And, and so when we said biography, it meant things like our class, our race, our gender, all these social groups that we fit into. Those all have a history. And knowing yourself sociologically means knowing all those histories of who you are and then, fit, and then trying to understand how the things you're facing today may or may not connect with that issue. You know, you may have problems that don't connect with your history and your ethnic group and your class group, and they may just be personal issues that you have for whatever reason. But there are some times when we face issues that, um, that do connect back to that. Uh, you know, it's uh, Black History Month right now. And one reason that we study Black history and, and as educators have said, you know, we want to pay attention to Black history, is because, you know, if you're a black student right now struggling in school, then understanding the history of black people in this country and their experience in schools and like how it used to be illegal to teach black people to read, for example. So it might make sense that it's harder now to compete against the very people that made it illegal for you to learn. Um, you know, that's, uh, you know, it helps black students to understand that history. And I think all of us can understand ourselves better if we understand our history. Uh, so all these ideas, you know, serial mail, cheerful robots, mindless conformity related to cheerful robots, private trouble folk issues, all of that is uh, part of uh, this idea of the sociological imagination. And the second term that we talked about was the idea of social structure. And again, I want to connect these ideas because I think things stick in your mind better when you understand how things are all related to each other and all the knowledge fits together. How do we connect social structure to, uh, to sociological imagination? Uh, well, public issues. When we say something is a problem that's a public problem, it isn't just a private problem. We're saying that it exists outside the individual. It exists somewhere in society. And social structure is a term we can use for, for that idea. But we also compared that idea to culture. And we said that uh, social structure is really a matter of who has what in society. It's the things in society, more or less. The material distribution of goods is the way sociologists put it. Things like money, things like housing, things like healthcare. These are things people either have or don't have. Um, what do people have? What do, what do people have or not have, not have? That's what we're talking about when we talk about structure of society as sociologists. So when we say a problem is like a structural problem, we're saying it's a problem that comes from people not having enough of this or that. So like a good question we could ask as we talked about what's another problem. Um, we could talk about like homelessness is a good one. You know, I've heard some people say homelessness is a housing problem. And I've heard other people say homelessness is not a housing problem. Well, what do we mean by that? Is it a, if there was more housing available, would there be less homelessness? Probably, I mean, that's the idea. If you don't have a home, then having a home means you're not homeless. On the other hand, a lot of people say that homelessness <laughs> is a result of other things, like people being addicted to drugs, or mentally ill, or, some, or bad values, or they're just lazy, or something like that. If you're homeless, you know, maybe it's something you did personally to yourself in a way, through what? Through what, you, uh, what people think and feel. Is culture. So 
I'm, I'm simplifying things and you know you could quibble with my definitions, but when a sociologist says something's a cultural problem, they're saying it has to do with how people think and feel. Something's going on inside them in their thinking, in their way they feel about stuff, that's making them behave in a certain way, that's a problem. Which is different from saying a problem is a result of people just not having enough. So for example, if you were totally sane and had no drug problems at all and were, had good morals and values, but you didn't have a home and you were living on the street, well, we'd say you're, you know, uh, what would you need to, to solve that problem, a home? So we're saying your, your, your problem is one of not having something. On the other hand, if you're choosing, you know, if you're mentally ill and you're just living in the forest or something, you know, we need to fix something going on with your head and heart. So anyway, that's, uh, and, and when we, but really what we were, uh, I'm complicating matters or, or maybe confusing things by talking about an individual. Really, we're talking about whole societies here. And sociologists compare societies, like, com like communities. So if we compare like homelessness in Santa Barbara, California, to homelessness in Sacramento, California, we can ask ourselves, what are the differences between these places? Is it the exact same problem? Would the same solution work in one place as another? And we have to ask ourselves, is the problem mainly a structural one or a cultural one? Or how do culture and structure uh, affect each other? How do people's thinking and feeling affect their, the way they distribute the resources in the community? Um, I was just reading about, for example, what does the term elite mean? We say we have an elite. Who are the elite, and why do they get to be the elite? And I was learning about, like, in France, I mean, in, in Rome, ancient Rome, when you ate together with a big group of people, if you were in the elite, that means you get to eat lying down. And if you were in the, uh, if you were a slave, you had to stand up through the whole meal. If you were a kid, you had to sit at a table and eat. And so, in their view, you know, getting to lie down while you're eating was, you know, a real privilege, I guess. But anyway you know, that's their culture. They think it's cool to lie down while eating, but it reflects the structure of the society who has what? If you own the building where the food's being served and you paid for the food, then you get to tell people where you stand and we lay down. Anyway, so structure and culture go together. But they're two terms we use a lot in, in this class. And uh, how do we know whether a problem is cultural or structural? Uh, we have to look at the data. And what kind of data do sociologists look at? We look at social facts. And I won't go all back into suicide again. That was a depressing topic. But the basic idea of social facts is that we look in sociology at aggregate behavior. We don't really look at individuals and why an individual does what they do. Psychology is the field that does that. Psychology, if it wants to understand why an individual person would commit suicide, like comparing individuals, why did this person commit suicide but this one didn't? Uh, we can look at individual factors, like things that happen to them, or chemistry of their brain, or something like that. But in sociology, we're looking at groups of people, and we're trying to understand the rates of behavior. Why, for example, Protestants commit suicide more often than Catholics and Jews? Um, but again, I said I wasn't going to talk about suicide, but there's lots of rates of behavior we could look at. For example, homelessness rate. Some cities have a high percentage of people without homes. Some cities don't. Uh, we could look at teen pregnancy rates. We can look at murder rates. We can look at unemployment rate. We can look at all, all kinds of questions about, and what is a rate of behavior? It's saying out of a certain number of people, it can be out of 100, out of 1,000, out of 100,000, whatever it is, out of a certain number of people, what percentage have this issue? And when we look at numbers like that, we're not comparing individuals to each other, we're comparing groups to each other. So we can ask, for example, uh, well, speaking of Black History Month, I was just hearing on the radio about menthol cigarettes. Um, they banned flavored cigarettes a few years ago. The federal government said you can't make cigarettes taste like a certain fruit or thing like that because it's a way of marketing to kids. But they didn't say that you couldn't market menthol cigarettes, those ones that taste like minty, fresh, or whatever. And if you go compare groups to each other, well, who smokes menthol cigarettes? Well, in the black community, the rate of, out of 100,000 smokers, what rate of them smoke menthol cigarettes? A very high rate. It's very popular in that community. 
In other communities, it's not. And so you could ask, well, why did they ban flavored cigarettes for all the other groups, but for black people, they said no. And now they're trying to ban it, but then you have other groups saying, well, why shouldn't black people get to smoke the cigarettes they want to? Anyway, that's a different debate, but the question of the rate of behavior. And then when you look at the cancer rate, out of 100,000 people who smoke menthol cigarettes, and compare them to 100,000 people who don't smoke, who smoke a different kind of cigarette, the cancer rates for menthol are higher. So it's this idea that it isn't just cigarettes that's killing them, it's menthol cigarettes in particular. I don't know if you know what I mean by menthol cigarettes, but those are things like cools. And if you don't know, good, you think you're not a smoker. But what I'm saying is, is there's uh, rates of behavior. There's many millions of things we could look at, but comparing rates means we're comparing groups like black people or menthol cigarette smokers to non-menthol cigarette smokers or black people to white people or to other groups or comparing communities like Santa Barbara versus Marysville. There's lots of ways we can break people up into groups of 100,000 or 1,000 or whatever math we're using. But it's that we're comparing groups and trying to see what it tells us about these groups. Um, for example, uh, I'll give you another example that relates to a lot of you. A lot of students, when I ask them who are they sociologically, they say they're uh, introverts. And that's a psychological term. So as sociologists, we're not really that concerned over who's an introvert and who's an extrovert. That psychologists want to know that. But I'd be interested as a sociologist, if I took all the Latino students in Yuba College, all the Latino women, and asked, are you an introvert or extrovert? How many would say they're an introvert? And if I took all the male white students, and I took all the female Asian students, and I took all the male Asian students, and I compared them, what percentage of this group says they're an introvert? And what percentage of this group? Would there be differences in the groups? I think there would. I have a theory that white males are less likely to say that they're shy. And women, especially brown women, are more likely to say they're introverts. And a lot of them will say, well, once I'm around my friends, I'm totally outgoing. So in other words, they're saying when I'm comfortable socially with people like me, I can be myself. But when I'm in a classroom and I'm the only Latina woman or something, introverted I'm quiet and so but that's so what, what I'm saying is that individual trait maybe if we look at it from a sociological standpoint comparing groups to each other and we find well why is it this group has a higher rate of introversion and this group has a lower one then that raises sociological questions about things like well who has the permission to speak in society and who has power and who doesn't and it raises structural and cultural questions about our society <laughs> So we're comparing in sociology groups and communities and whole clusters of people, not usually comparing one individual to another and trying to figure out what makes one tick and another one not. Does that make sense? All right, and so, uh, so another term, by the way, just quickly, that's mentioned in your textbook is structuration. And I won't spend a lot of time on it, it's interesting because the main author of your textbook is a guy named uh, Anthony Giddens, and he's one of the most famous sociologists in the world, and this is one of his big ideas that he himself invented, and so we would be remiss, I guess, in this class if we're using his textbook and we don't talk about structuration. The basic idea is that we as individuals are products of our social structure, and I, I guess I would include culture. Your society shapes you as the individual. In other words, you can't just, we like to think, and, and here's another way to think about sociology. Sociology kind of argues with mainstream American culture. When we talk about what we think and believe as Americans and feel, we like to feel the individual gets to be whoever they want to be. That you get to be whoever you want to be in life and it's all up to you. And that's what we say in America. <laughs> but in sociology, we kind of argue against that. And we say, well, no, really, as an individual, you're a product of your society. You didn't just get to choose everything about who you are and how you are. For example, I'm a sociologist. Did I just willingly choose sociology just as a free choice to become a sociologist? In a way, but in another way, my dad was a sociologist. And if I'm trying to make it in America and get a good middle class job that pays my bills, it makes sense to do something that I already kind of have an idea of how it works because my dad already did it. 
And a lot of us tend to go into the things that we already know about because our parents did them or we were exposed to it. But that means I didn't get to be an investment banker. I knew when I went to college, there were guys whose dads made millions of dollars investing in the stock market, but that wasn't my world. They became that and I became a teacher. But what I'm saying is, so do you just get to totally choose what you want to be in life or do you get to be the kind of things you're set up to be? At the same time, we feel like we do have free will. And I'm not being the exact same sociologist that my dad is. I'm not just a, a carbon copy of, my, of the previous generation. Each individual can also shape their society, the social structure, and culture. You can contribute to your society and your culture, and you can help change it. And so that's why social change happens. If we were always just products of our society, then things would never change. We would just be carbon copies of our parents and we would do things just how they did and things wouldn't change much. But each generation can look at the world as it is and say, hey, I don't think I like this part or that part or I wanna do things this way. And so each young generation as it comes up does change the world a little bit. It happens slowly over time and not all at once, but social change does happen. And so Giddens was trying to give us a theory, and that, by the way, was another key term for us. Theories are attempts to explain social facts. And Giddens is saying here, one way we can explain social change is by this idea of structuration, that people, yes, they're, they're products of their social structure and culture, and they think and feel the way society tells them to think and feel, and they have or don't have what society allows them to have or not have. But they also have their own independent mind, and they can challenge those things and look at those things kind of objectively and say, hey, you know, try to fix them. And so things, and so that's his theory. It's an attempt to explain the fact that things do tend, to, people do tend to get a lot of the, you know, do the things their parents did. Very common to have the same political beliefs your parents did, the same voting patterns, the same general career patterns, but things do change. So both are true. Anyway, so that's structuration. And, uh, and theory, by the way, when we were trying to explain suicide, when Durkheim said, you know, I think it's social solidarity, that's what I talked about the other day. When people are connected to each other, then suicide's less likely to happen in a social group if a group's tight knit, social solidarity. If it's a weak social group where people aren't really connected to each other, then suicide's more likely to happen in that group. So again, he was comparing groups and the, the, the social facts about those groups, that they have different suicide rates, and he's trying to explain why that's the case. Uh, I'm trying to remember if I'm skipping any key terms. I don't think I am for now. But now I want to kind of try and illustrate the key terms by giving you a social fact and asking you to come up with some theories that could help explain that social fact. So here's the social fact. And I, I know not all of us are numbers-oriented people, so I'm not going to get a, into a lot of numbers with it. But the fact has to do with binge drinking among college students. So first of all, what's binge drinking? Binge drinking is just drinking to get drunk. I mean, if you sit down to drink alcohol and your goal is to you know, feel it and get a little drunk, then that's called binge drinking. For men, it means you know, drinking more than like four drinks at a time. For women, it might mean like more than three drinks at a time. If you're sitting down to get drunk, that's called binge drinking. Issues around college students binge drinking you know, have been on the minds of a lot of college professors and especially college presidents, you know, some schools have problems with students drinking. Chico State is one that's had problems just up the road here where people drink too much and they get into accidents or sexual assault situations or they, or they you know, get poisoned from alcohol. UC Davis had some of these problems. I don't know that we have that problem here at Yuba College, but community colleges aren't as much of party schools as places like Chico State might be and UC Davis, Sac State. But binge drinking among college students is higher today than 
in the 1970s. Binge drinking rates are higher today than in the 1970s. I'm not even sure if this fact is a real fact at the moment. But let's say it is. It was a few years ago. I don't know exactly what the current binge drinking rates are. Um, but so my lecture is a little outdated in that I'm using this example. Well, I don't know if it's outdated because I don't know what the binge drinkers are at the moment. But let's just assume this is the true fact I'm giving you, that binge drinking rates right now are higher than they were in the 70s among college students. And I'm asking you, what are your theories about why that might be the case? You guys are today's college students, and I'm telling you that you guys are more likely to binge drink. Again, likeliness, when we say, you know, out of 100,000, that doesn't mean you are in that 100,000. It just means out of 100,000 college students, more of them now binge drink than before. The rate has gone up. So what theories do you have about why that might be the case? Okay, so what? What's your theory there? That college students are self-medicating, they're dealing with more mental health problems, and so they're using alcohol to self-medicate. Okay, and I'll call it self-medication for mental health reasons. Okay, solid theory maybe. Certainly a lot of reasons to think students today are facing more mental health issues than before, although that's what I would press you to develop in your theory is why is there more mental health now issues than before? What, what's the explanation for that? And you could maybe bring up things like, I don't know, COVID, um, social media. Uh, there's other reasons why maybe why people are more stressed out. Okay, and other theories? my insistence that you engage in the class. If all you want to do is passively take the class online is great for that. If you want to take the live class, you've got to be ready to be in your face and raise your hand and stuff. Yeah? I guess maybe like technology, especially when younger kids are being really big on anti-social. Okay, so people are more just staying by themselves and they're drinking alone maybe, or? Or because they're more, they're less social when they get to college, they need more liquid courage to be able to deal with other people. To be able to be themselves. To be able to be social and stuff like that. And so you're saying more, maybe I, I think I'm going to call yours more social anxiety now. People have anxiety about being, dealing with other people, and so they drink to loosen up and, okay. Any other theories? Yeah? To fit in. To fit in? So if you think everybody else is drinking, you feel like I better drink too, and so it's a peer pressure kind of thing. I mean, again, I would say, why is there more peer pressure now than there was in the 70s? What, what's your theory about why the peer pressure is higher? You don't have to have one. I'm putting you on the spot. I could suggest some. Maybe it's because there's um, more diverse colleges now. Like back then, it was more just mainly white males in college and some white females. But nowadays, you have a very diverse college um, environment, which can lead to more social anxiety. It can also lead to more desire to find a friend group and really just fit in with your friend group and feel like you have them. And if you feel your friend group drinks, then you better drink with them. OK. I feel like I'm a little more glorified now. Alcohol is more glorified by? Over television. Okay, mass media influences. And a lot of times when we're dealing with sociological problems, people point to the media as being the thing. And you're saying media glorification of alcohol. And again, I'd ask, well, why is it more glorified now than it was? Or in what ways is it? Um, and I can answer that for you. Uh, one is... Uh, you know, they used to, the alcohol industry purposely didn't advertise hard alcohol on television. There was a, a self-imposed rule that they said, we're only going to advertise beer and wine on TV and not things like whiskey, bourbon, vodka. Those are hard spirits and they can mess you up much easier than beer and wine can. But in recent years, they just 
took that rule off themselves. And if you look at a lot of cable shows, they show Jack Daniels and vodka and all kinds. So they are showing more on the media, more people drinking harder stuff. Another thing I would mention is the alcohol industry has tried very hard to market directly to college students. They got in trouble, in fact, but uh, I think it was Budweiser, a few years ago, started making their bottles in the colors, the school colors of the colleges where they were selling it by. So if it was near UCLA, it was blue and yellow. If it was near Stanford, it was red, you know. And people were saying, well, you're marketing to college students, but most of them are under 21. So aren't you just purposely trying to get under 21 year old people to drink beer? And they had to stop doing that, but that certainly fits your theory that the alcohol industry is trying and the media are trying harder to get college students to drink. Any other theories? It kind of goes along with that one. Like they market more like seltzer and like flavored drinks and you don't taste it as much. So it's like more like you want to actually drink something and it doesn't even taste like alcohol. Excellent point. So alcohol pops, they call them, or they're like sodas and they're sweet and yeah. other ways to get the, yeah, and all the seltzers that are out there. And so not just media glorification, but industry marketing, trying to get college students to drink more and get women to drink more. They really, a lot of those, Things are marketed to women with colorful, pretty seltzer cans and white paw and all this stuff. Um, all right, so any other theories you want to suggest? Well, let me throw a wrench in your theory a little bit. A wrench meaning let's break out the data a little more. This is a very raw data thing. All college students are drinking more. But when we break out data, what people mean by that is, let's break it down by social groups like the ones we're talking about. Let's break it down into things like race and class and gender and see if the binge drinking rates are the same for all those subgroups of college students. So if I asked you, who do you think, what's your profile in terms of race, class, and gender, who do you think is the most likely to be a binge drinker when they come to college? What's their race like? What's their gender like? What's their class like? I think it's white people. Think it's white people? I think so. How many think it's white people? How many think it's black people? How many think it's Latino people? How many think it's Asian people? The number one person to drink is white, yes? Are they a dude? Are they a dudette? Mostly dudes. Mostly dudes. <laughs> a lot of them are dudes, so they're male. Are they poor, working class people, first generation college student? Is that who he is? Or is he more likely to be an upper middle class person with a dad that went to college and a granddad that went to college? Which do you think, how many think it's the upper middle class? How many think it's the working class? It's the upper middle class guy. That's who's doing a lot of the drinking. Who's at the bottom of the list? Who, when they came to college the first day, is the least likely to be a binge drinker that year? What's her race, do you think? It is a woman. Asian? Nope. Black. Women. Working class. She's the first person to ever go to college in her family. And they call her up, How, how's college going? I'm getting drunk every night. No, I have studied, I went to class, I went to a special lecture. She's really excited to be there at college. His dad, grandpa, great grandpa all went to Stanford and he's the 10th generation Stanford student. Hey, how did, how's it going there at Stanford? We're having so much fun. Getting drunk all the time, football games, it's great. Um, these are caricatures, but that if we're trying to understand the data, why is it that a black woman first in her school? Now again, if we're talking about non-college students, if we're talking about people of general population, these racial profiles and class profiles are probably different. But if we're trying to understand college students and they've been drinking, just lumping them all together as college students and trying to come up with a theory, might not get us very far. We want to break out the data and compare groups to each other. So if we say like mental health problems, are white rich guys having a lot more mental health problems and challenges than poor black women? 
I mean, is our mental health theory holding water here as we break it down that way? Who's number two up here, do you think? Who's drinking with this white dude? Right, white, wealthy dude. White. Or female. Upper middle class. That's another person that's likely to get drunk at college at Stanford. Who else? Who's down here? Who's also not getting drunk? Mm -hmm. hmm? Asian. We love to think that Asians aren't getting drunk, but actually the third group up here is Asian male upper middle class. Just because somebody's serious about school doesn't necessarily mean, and that's this Asian stereotype of the model minority, the model student, but that doesn't mean they don't like partying. Um, or have the means to party. So who else? So that's so when we start asking, well, why? Who's partying at college, and who is it? Is it cultural, like thinking and feeling, or is it structural? Who has what? I mean, if you have money, you have money to drink and stuff. If you have money, you don't need to worry about failing a class because you can pay for tutors or you can take the class again and stuff like that. If you don't have money, you don't have those privileges and freedoms. So who's down here not drinking with her? Uh, Latina, women, working class. When we talk to them about their college experiences, they're not saying, oh yeah, I went out and got, I got drunk. I was so wasted every night. They're going to class, they're studying, they're doing the things college students are supposed to do, not the things that partiers are supposed to do. Who's also up here? Well, black. Males. Upper middle class. We don't think of black males as being upper middle class in general. That's our stereotype. But in colleges, again, and, and on the West Coast, we don't see it as much. But the East Coast has some wealthy colleges. And there definitely is a class of American people that are black that are in the upper middle class. And so what, what are we comparing here? You have a different theory here now. What could explain why when you go to college campus, you might find wealthy white people, Asian people, and black people getting drunk on a Friday night and not seeing working class students. And down here, working class white students are down here too. They're the ones not getting drunk. When I say working class, I mean you're the kind of person who's you're the first generation in your family to go to college. Your parents might not own their own home. Uh, they might not make over $100,000 a year. So that's what we mean by class. Any other theories? Like, what, why is there been drinking going on on the college campus, and where is it happening? What's your theory now? No theory? Sorry if this is boring to you. Uh, I'm glad that if the drinking on college campus is not in your <laughs> experience and it doesn't matter to you, good. Uh, but it is a big issue up in Chico State, like I said, at UC Davis. And where are these problems occurring? What's your theory here? The basic idea here is this is all part of fraternities and sororities. Or what's called the Greek system. And if, again, if you don't know about it, you're not missing much. But most universities have what are called sororities and fraternities. They're private clubs for the wealthier students. You have to pay a lot of money each year to be a member of the fraternity or sorority. And when you get to be in the fraternity or sorority, you get to live in a special house. Uh, for your fraternity story. If you go to UC Davis, there's a whole row of houses they call fraternity row. A lot of them have big neon signs on them. The neon signs are sometimes provided by the alcohol industry because they have these parties. And on Friday nights, you can go up and down the street to all the different fraternities and sororities and drink and party. And it's just like a downtown club scene, only it's not 25 year olds, it's 18 to 21 year olds. It's a little bit scandalous because the alcohol industry promotes these fraternity and sorority parties at colleges and a lot of students get drunk and get hurt and women get assaulted and the alcohol industry makes a lot of money. But what I'm saying is the binge drinking problem is concentrated in the fraternities and sororities. And if you're a working class student, a poor student person in your family to go to college, you're probably not even going anywhere near those places. You're more focused on the library, on your classroom, on other things that are more about academics. So that changes our theory here again. It's not about uh, 
maybe not about these other things we thought it might be about, but really just about a structural thing of people with the means, with houses, fraternity houses, with extra money on hand, with the privilege to do well in school because their parents already went to college. They're the ones exercising privilege by partying their way through college. And the ones who are not as privileged, who don't have as much, um, have a different culture in mind, a culture of studying. And so they have less what they, um, again, I'm getting back to structure and culture. This shows us structure and culture. When you have more, you can have a culture of partying and drinking and fraternities and sororities. When you have less in terms of money, a place to get drunk, uh, then you have a different culture. And so, uh, and, uh, and it also raises the question, well, how then should we solve the problem? How would you solve the problem of binge drinking? If you were a college president, if they said, okay, you're president of Chico State right now, and your task is to reduce binge drinking by 30% at your college, how are you going to do that? Do you have any, what would be a, a good way to do it? By making a score club. Uh... <laughs> well, why not get rid of the fraternities and sororities? If that's the place where all this is happening, that would be the obvious choice if you're a college president. Is This is where the problem is. It's all happening right there. It's because of these clubs that do underage drinking. So let's get rid of these clubs and focus on academics. Why not do that? You have, and, and by the way, they've tried to, or some people have floated the idea. But why do you think it doesn't happen? <laughs> Lindsay? Um, maybe the, the money that's coming in. Exactly. So these fraternities and sororities are some of the wealthiest people on campus. It's the alumni. I don't know if you know how college and universities work, but people whose parents and grandparents went to the college, they donate money to the college in a big way. And so if you're a college president, you, you propose to your college community, we're going to get rid of the fraternities and sororities. You would have all your wealthiest donors calling the school saying, what are you doing? That's my fraternity. That's where I went. I love, they have this thing called homecoming universities do every year. Homecoming means come back to your college and watch your old football team play and go back to your old fraternity and get drunk with the new students. When I went to college, they had these all the time. We used to get drunk with all these old guys. And they're like, I remember back when I was here. And, uh, and, uh, and so, but it's, uh, so it's, it, it's again, a question of power and the social structure. And if you are a college president trying to run a college, then trying to challenge the most wealthy, powerful people in the college community is not going to work for you. So they haven't done it. So what do they do? Well, a bunch of college presidents got together and they took out an ad. College presidents were worried about this problem of binge drinking on college campuses. And so they took out an ad in the New York Times trying to convince the American population that we need to solve this problem. And what was their solution to college presidents said, our solution would be, let's lower the drinking age. Something, a question mark there. Do you think that's a good idea? Why, do you, why would the college presidents, these are supposedly smart people with PhDs and stuff like that, why would they uh, propose lowering the drinking age as a way of solving the problem of binge drinking. Doesn't that seem counter, contradictory? Why, why do you think they would propose that? Can you think of any good logical reasons why that might be a good idea? If you, if you make it legal for college students to be drunk, 18 year olds, would that solve the problem of people drinking too much and sexual assault and accidents and stuff, and alcohol poisoning. Why do they think it might help with that, do you think? They wouldn't have to go to the parties to get it. <laughs> uh, you're getting there. I mean, they, they said it in there when they were justifying this idea, and they wrote this whole full page ad, so they didn't just say, let's lower the drinking age. They said, here's why. why what was their justification? Well, one is the idea of the forbidden fruit syndrome. You know what the forbidden fruit syndrome refers to? Who had the forbidden fruit? Anybody read the Bible here? 
Do you remember um, Adam and Eve? Adam and Eve were told by God, you cannot have apples. If that's an apple tree and there's apples on there and they're shiny and red, but don't eat them. And what did they do? They ate them. And that was sin. And, um, and, but one idea is if you tell people not to do something, sometimes it makes it more attractive to them to want to do it. They want to know what they're missing. And that's what these college students say. Maybe by saying to college students, you can't have alcohol, or you better not have alcohol, alcohol is off limits. Maybe we're making it more attractive in a way. And they pointed to Europe, for example. Many European countries don't have a strict drinking age. It's, ex you know, and a lot of European people get experience drinking alcohol before they reach 21. And they see it as food. Like, I have a glass of wine with my spaghetti. And it's not this thing that it's forbidden, and once you get it, you drink as much of it as possible. It's this thing you have a little bit of with your spaghetti and your cheese. And so the college presidents were saying, we need to be more like Europe, where alcohol is just a normal part of life. It isn't this forbidden thing that once you get access to it, you're going to go crazy with it. And so, yeah, fraternities and sororities are places where young people can get access to alcohol, but by having it be this forbidden thing, it makes them want to do it more. And I'm only dwelling on this, not because binge drinking is such an important topic for us, but this is an interesting sociological idea that we as a society, if we keep telling people no, 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 does that really solve our problem? If we keep raising penalties and saying no, and if you do it, we're going to punish you for it, I think it's a... It's a big misconception a lot of people have. It's bad sociology a lot of people have. A lot of parents have it. A lot of managers have it. They think if you just scare people really hard to away from something, that they won't do it. Like you say to your kids, you better not go out at night. I'll catch you and you'll be in so much trouble, young lady. And every girl I know who was told that by her dad did go out at night and she was told not to. Whereas if you have a more understanding relationship with your kid and say, well, here's the reasons why I want you home by this hour. And they have some say in the matter. That, to me, is a much better form of authority and management than just telling people you better or else. Because people don't necessarily don't do something just because the people in charge of them told them not to. Um, but anyway, um, it, what I'm saying is consent of the governed. When you are being told not to do something, if you agree that it's a good rule, you're more likely to follow it. When you're told by somebody you better follow it or I'll hurt you, well, then you're not being asked to agree with the rule. You're just being asked to follow it. And you might not. And most of us don't like following rules we don't agree with. So forbidden fruit syndrome was one idea. Another idea here, and I think this kind of goes to your point, uh, they wanted to change ownership of the problem, is the way I would put it. Whose problem is it that college students are getting drunk? and getting sick, and beating each other up, or falling off balconies, or raping each other. If, if drinking's illegal, then the cops are in charge of it. It's their problem. Illegal behavior is going on over there at the college campus, and we've got to go over there and handle it. And if it's an illegal problem, then the cops own it. Do the cops own the problem? Is it the cops' problem? The college presidents were trying to say, if you lower the drinking age, and make it legal for college students to drink, then any problems that are occurring, those are our problems to handle as a college. So if boys are, you know, people are being unsafe, if they're getting sick, we'll handle it. I went to a, a very elite college on the East Coast where they had their own police force. And if they caught you doing illegal stuff, they didn't send you to the real cops. Like if people were high on illegal drugs, they would like give them some orange juice and put them in a nice little room so they could get better. Um, if you were, you know, having too much alcohol and throwing up, they'd come and give you some detox or something like that. My point is, that was an elite school. The rich people who send their kids there didn't want their kids getting arrested. And so they had set it up so that any illegal problems going on in the school wouldn't lead to actual arrest by the real authorities, but would lead to being, you know, managed by the, the school authorities. And that's, I think, essentially what these college presidents were saying they wanted for their big public schools like UC Davis and um, Chico State. Let us handle this problem. It's students drinking, and they shouldn't be, but we can handle it as a discipline problem. We have our own 
forms of authority here and punishment and correction and rehabilitation. And so we will help these students get off their binge drinking. We don't want the cops being the ones that arrest people, put them in jail, do that kind of stuff. So it's again a question of power and who has it and how it works in our society. And yeah, creating a support group to help the drinkers, that might or might not get us somewhere. Um, but if, the, if it's a structural problem, then just trying to change how people think and feel about alcohol might not work. Uh, you know, it might be a structural thing. And that's what these college presidents are kind of saying, is it's a structural thing, and we should be the ones in charge of this matter, because it's our college. Who has what? We have this college, we have these students, we don't think the cops should have this problem in their ownership. Anyway, so those are uh, some key terms uh, for sociology, and we again will be um, coming back quite a bit to a lot of these ideas, but I wanted to make sure we had them under our belts at this point. So we're asking really at this point in the class, what is sociology? And really in a lot of ways, as I think I mentioned on the first day of school, um, we're answering that question the whole, the whole semester It's going to take us to answer that question. Because there isn't just one answer to it. And so what answers have we gotten so far to this question? Well, we said there is such a thing as small s sociology. That's what we all do. It's the knowledge we all need to, uh, to function in society. Uh, that's the sociological imagination. We also said it has the study of social groups. So when I asked you, who are you sociologically? And I said, well, to describe yourself sociologically really means to name and list the groups that you're a member of. Because that's who you are. It's your family, it's your religion, it's your town, it's your country, it's your ideology, it's your gender, your class, your race. So that's another way of putting it. It's the most broad way you can put it is the study of society. But that's kind of a, a, a broad term. So we're going to start getting into now what I would call capital S sociology. Which is the kind of sociology that people with training in sociology do. Or, you know, what we call the, the sociology that's taught in colleges and universities by people who are capital S sociologists who have degrees from colleges and universities in sociology. So that's where we're going now, is to take a, a deeper look into capital S sociology. sociology. And that is a little more specific than just saying sociology is the study of society. Capital S sociology is more specific than that. We don't study all societies throughout time. It's pretty, pretty limited, really, which societies we focus on in sociology. And I want to suggest to you that 1492 is the key. So the answer, one answer to the question is, it's the study of modern society. We don't study ancient societies in sociology. We don't even really study medieval societies in sociology. We are focused on modern society and what some people call modernity. That's a term you'll probably hear a lot in your college career, especially if you take humanities courses like history and English and stuff like that. So it's not to say we are living in a society today that we can call modernity. It's it's, it's modern society. But when, well, when did it start, and how, how is it different from other possible things to study? 
1492, I say, is the key turning point. I think it's very accurate and simple to say that the modern world starts becoming modern, the world starts becoming modern, right around 1492. What happened in 1492? Can you tell me in rhyme, anybody? In 1492, Columbus, they don't teach that rhyme anymore in college, in, in elementary school. In 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue. It's an old saying they used to teach in elementary school. That was the year Columbus set foot um, in North America. when They brought over the, the Nina, the Pinta, the Santa Maria, the three ships from Portugal or Spain, and they came. Uh, why was that such an important event? Well, that's the discovery of the new world. Right? Imagine if today we found out there's a whole other planet Earth, just as big as ours, but there's no people on it, but it's filled with trees and animals and all kinds of plants that we've never seen before, and animals we've never seen before, and, but, and we can live on it, it's got oxygen and atmosphere, and it's like right behind the moon. We didn't know. Would that change anything here on planet Earth if we suddenly found out there was a whole other Earth? I think it would change things dramatically, right? We would stop talking about all the battles we're having here and start thinking about how do we get to go visit this other place. Whole new products would start coming in from this other place, all kinds of new animals, new foods, new plants, new products. It would be a whole new experience, a whole radical change in how we're experiencing life on planet Earth. And for Europe, discovering a whole new world was, and not just Europe, or Asia too, this whole new world suddenly changed what planet Earth was all about. And up until that time, we can say, well, there's a couple different periods that we don't study. The year zero, you know, is when Jesus Christ, it's the year we use, uh, the year zero. Before that is ancient times, ancient society. In ancient society, we don't really, I'll say a little bit about it in this class, but if you want to go study like ancient Rome, ancient Greece, or the pyramids, and you know, those places all had a lot of the things I'm talking about, social structure and class and gender and stuff like that. But we don't spend a lot of time in sociology studying those. Why? Well, one reason is because there's a whole bunch of other fields in a university where if you want to go study those things, you can go take a class in antiquities or archaeology or you know, other things like that. And so there are other scholars that study those things. And they were studying them before sociology ever came into being, and so we just kind of leave those ones aside. But it also doesn't really relate to sociology. There was no sociology in those days. So we don't have much to say about it. After year zero, that's when we talk about the Middle Ages, or medieval society, or the Dark Ages. We don't have much to say about that either. The kings and queens, the great monarchies of Europe, you know, all these battles and, you know, crusades that were going on. You can go watch Harry Potter movies and stuff like that if you want to learn about kings and queens and arm, knights in armor and all that stuff. But we don't focus on that in sociology. We focus on what happened after that. Modern society. And I'm putting a little arrow here because it's not complete yet. I mean, it isn't done becoming modern in the world. If we look around the world, there's places around the world that are still living in societies that are more like what we would call Middle Age societies, and some that are even in like ancient kind of situations. But we in sociology tend to focus on the modern world, but what I'm saying is the modern world is an unfolding thing. The whole world is becoming more and more modern every day, we could say. And why is that? Well, 1492 set off revolutions. It was such a big discovery that it revolutionized the world. What revolutions? Well, I would say some of the, the first one really was religious. I think it's significant that the Inquisition started in 1492. That was when the Pope started saying, you better be Catholic or I'm kicking you out of Spain. Well, it was in Spain that it started. And they were talking to Jewish people and Muslim people and stuff like that. <laughs> Why was there a religious revolution? Well, the Catholic Church was in charge of religion through all the centuries before this. And the Catholic Church had been saying for centuries, the world's flat. 
and the sun revolves around the earth. And if you try to say it's anything different than that, well, we'll kill you. And when Columbus discovered the new world, it confirmed what some people had already been saying. We think the world's round. And we think actually we revolve around the sun. And when people were saying that, like Copernicus and Galileo and stuff, they were, you know, punishing them for saying it. But when Columbus proved it, then Catholic Church has to sit there and go, well, yeah, what were we saying? Never mind. Well, people started saying, maybe we don't listen to you anymore. You've been killing people for saying this, but now it's clear that it is true. So we don't know if we want to listen to you anymore. And I mentioned the other day Protestantism, you know, new religion starting to say there's other ways for us to worship God than how the church tells us to. And that religious kind of change in thinking about what is the center of the universe? Is it Earth or is it actually the sun and we're revolving around it? That really decentered a lot of people's understanding of where is the place of the Earth in the universe and where are we? And that decentering led to political revolution. So there's a kind of religious revolution or a kind of the enlightenment is what I call it. People started saying, we don't, we don't believe the church anymore. And the church has been keeping us ignorant, keeping us in the dark ages. And now we're going to enlighten ourselves. We're going to become, shed light on things like Columbus showed a light that we are, you know, round and moving around the, the sun. And what else can we discover? That was, what was amazing is he discovered it by getting in a boat and going as far as he could a certain direction. And people started saying, well, what else can we discover? There's probably a lot of other knowledge out there that the church didn't tell us about or didn't know itself. And if a guy like Columbus can discover stuff, then any of us could discover stuff. And people started discovering all kinds of stuff. But I'll get to that in a second. The political revolutions, though, were almost the immediate thing. Which political revolutions? Well, the kings and queens ruled Europe, right? And if you ever asked as a regular person, if you weren't a king and queen, or a, some kind of noble, or some kind of aristocrat, why do they get to be in charge and tell me what to do? Like, what's so great about them? And the church, then they would, the noble would say to you, go ask the church why I get to tell you what to do. And the church would say, they get to tell you what to do because they're divine, they're descended from God. And you're not, you're just common. They're noble, you're common. So you have to do what they tell you. And people stopped listening to the church because of the lie about the earth. And so then they wanted to stop listening to them about this idea that certain people are chosen by God to rule over them. And so they started overthrowing the kings and queens. And in England, they got rid of the king and queen. In America, we said, we're not listening to you anymore. Um, in uh, France, they killed the king and queen and chopped their heads off. And many other countries, the democratic revolution began happening. In other words, democracy, the challenge to the kings and queens. And once the kings and queens were challenged and their power was no more absolute, no longer absolute over people, that allowed people to start questioning a lot of things. And so another revolution is the scientific revolution. People realized you could discover stuff. And you don't have to just listen to the church. The church doesn't know everything. And not all the knowledge is contained in the Bible. The church would tell people, you don't need to know anything. It's all right here. God told us everything we need to know is right here. And scientists began saying, well, I discovered all kinds of stuff. We discovered electricity in America. Ben Franklin discovered, discovered coal, you know, coal power, all kinds of ways of doing things. Also really small things with microscopes. Wow, there's cells down there. And bodies are made up of cells. And telescopes, wow, there isn't just a moon out there. There's planets, there's other galaxies, there's a whole universe out there they didn't tell us about. And so as people began to learn about all the stuff that's out there that the church wasn't talking about, it led to a whole scientific revolution and all kinds of new discoveries happened. The age of discovery is sometimes called. So this didn't all happen in 1492, obviously, but it's this ongoing revolution, these American Revolution, 1776, French Revolution, around the same time. So it didn't all happen immediately, 
But what I'm trying to tell you is sociology is a product of all of these revolutions. Sociology is about science. It's about trying to have a scientific understanding of, um, of how we work and how the world works and how to make it better. It comes out of this idea that you don't just have to do what God tells you, but or what the church tells you that God told you, but what we can figure out ourselves about how to do things better. We can figure out better government, better social arrangements, better neighborhoods, better buildings, all kinds of ways of living better. Um, it was also about you know democracy, this idea that individual people can um, have rights and have some say in how their society is run. And that you don't just have to be told what to do by people above you, but that everybody could have some say in how things go. Um, and so sociology is a product of all of this. You wouldn't have a science of society trying to understand democracy, trying to understand individuals. That's another way we could see all of this is it really freed individual people from being stuck in a certain religion or a certain political, I mean, it was really about liberating the individual from all these ties that we were stuck with through previous centuries. And sociology is trying to understand all these changes. You wouldn't have sociology without these changes, but also sociology is trying to look back on the changes and critique modern society. So sociology is very modern. It's a science. It cares about individual rights and improvement and development. But it also was started by people who said, this modern world isn't perfect yet. It got rid of a lot of things we used to have. We used to have traditional society back here. That's another way I'll put it. Traditional society is how people live in medieval times, and still do in a lot of places on planet Earth. When we think of traditional societies, one way to think of them is villages, village life. And sociology is in some ways, if it's the study of modern society, it's really the study of how we shifted our lives as we moved from living in villages to living in city life. In the modern world, more and more people live in cities. In fact, the cities are still growing on planet Earth, and a lot of the villages are emptying out. In China, for example, big cities are growing, and the old traditional villages are emptying out, which is a problem for China, for example. You have a lot of old people still live in the villages, but the young people have all moved to the cities for work, and so you have old people sitting in the villages with no one to take care of them, and problems like that. And you have similar situations in places like Mexico and India. And I'm mentioning places that you may have experience with where you have older relatives, family members that are still living in traditional societies where things like traditional religion, you know, religion, agriculture. Oh, that's the other thing I forgot to mention. The scientific revolution also caused the industrial revolution. Industrial revolution is the idea of making things in factories. In villages, people make their own stuff. Every village makes its own stuff. But in the modern world, we industrialize production. So things are made in factories, and they're made in places where all the factories are concentrated. So that's why cities grow, is that's where the factories are. And then you have other things serving the factories, like equipment shops and repair shops. And so once you have a factory, a lot of other work grows up around the factory, and people go where the work is. And so people in the modern world have been going to where the factory production happens. And you couldn't have factory production without the scientific revolution where things like electricity and coal power were discovered. And so sociology says this rapid change where lots of people have moved into cities, and they've given up their old traditional lifestyles with their old religion, their old family ties, their old ways of doing things, like just growing food and making your own handcrafts. That's the old way of doing things. And that's the traditional way, and that's the pre-modern way. But in the modern world, we tend to live in cities. Things are made in factories. We just buy things at the store. We can make them ourselves. It's a very different lifestyle, the modern world. 
and there and a lot of the so and sociology started in the 19 in the 1900s i mean in the 1800s the 19th century uh again a little bit critical of all of this and saying well are cities healthy is everyone okay in the cities are people able to live without their traditional ways of thinking and feeling and knowing i mean if you're just a free-floating individual living in a big city with all these products to buy and stuff are you going to know how to live or do you need your traditional religion and your traditional structures and your traditional ways of living so that people can be happy and healthy and this division between and you know you may experience this division between traditional and modern in your own life you may have grandmas and grandpas and stuff that are very traditional in their way of thinking men over here women over here strict religion you know work with your hand work with the land and they don't understand you know things like social media and things being stored in the cloud and stuff like that or you know uh, people are worried uh, you know the, the, the traditional people are worried that the modern people won't know how to live you won't know how to make good choices you'll be sinful for example because in the traditional world your behavior is regulated by the church by your elders by all these people making sure you're kept in line but in the modern world who tells you what to do you're living in an apartment somewhere, no grandma around, no priest around. Yeah, I'll drink. Yeah, I'll drug. Yeah, I'll, you know, do whatever. And so a lot, so, so one distinction between the traditional world and the modern world is this question of how are individuals going to manage themselves and take care of themselves? And are they going to be healthy, happy people? Or are they going to have mental health problems and drug addiction problems and moral problems and all kinds of stuff like that? And so, the so, so sociology is both a product of the modern world. We wouldn't have sociology without all these revolutions. And sociology wants to help promote this change where we become more democratic and more technological and more scientific as we grow forward. But sociology also is worried about it, just like the grandma in a traditional village saying, you know, are we hurting ourselves or what are we missing in this modern world that we may have used to have? And what are some problems in this modern world that we're facing because we don't have the things we used to have? And so that's all my kind of tee up for why did these founding fathers, is what we're going to call them, why did these European men in places like Germany and France in the 19th century, why did they decide they need this new thing called sociology? And as I mentioned to you, there's at least three different kinds of sociology. So as we try to figure out why did they start sociology, we also want to ask, why didn't they all just agree on what sociology is? Why? And so we, we won't get to this today, but on starting next week, we're going to talk about the founding fathers of sociology. And I put that in quotes because they weren't really, I mean, that term founding fathers comes from the United States Revolution, like George Jefferson, and Washington, they were the founding fathers of America. But in sociology nowadays, we use this term to refer to Marx, Karl Marx, Max Weber, and Emil Durkheim. We already met Emil Durkheim when we talked about suicide. He was the guy that studied that. We haven't yet talked about Karl Marx and Max Weber, but we will starting next week. And as we'll also see, they weren't the only people that helped start sociology. There were women involved. There were non-white people involved. But the way that things have progressed in the world, a lot of those people kind of got forgotten over time. And nowadays, we're trying to remember that there were black and women and people that did help start sociology. And we'll talk about them as well, too. But we'll orient, orient the discussion around these quote-unquote founding fathers. All right, so we'll see you. Meanwhile, try to avoid binge drinking and other modern problems as you uh, go out in the world this weekend. We have a Tuesday. Okay, you too. Take care. Have a good weekend. Thank you. Bye-bye.